to be talking about parametric and polar equations. And so uh, we're going to start with parametric equations, talk about exactly what they are, and then look at a couple examples. So the parametric equations, what we have instead of our normal x and y, is going to be the introduction of this new parameter, which we're going to call t. And so for parametric equations, what we're going to do is we're going to define x and y uh, as functions or in terms of t. We can typically think of t as time. So let's go ahead and look at a quick example. Um, and actually first, uh, let's just go ahead and write what exactly this means. And so this means that what we have is x of t and y of t like so. Oh, so, um, one important property of parametric equations is unlike uh, our normal equations like y equals x squared, things like that, is that parametric equations have an orientation. That is a direction. Um, and so let's look at an example to see exactly what we mean by this. Good. And so our example is going to be um, x of t is equal to 2 times t, y of t equal to t squared. Okay, so what this is saying is as we plug in different values of t, or as we consider different values of t, my x coordinate and my y coordinate is going to change. And so let's give a specified range for t. So we're going to say we're going to look at these equations for all t that is in 0 to 2. Okay, so uh, what exactly is going to go on here? So let's go ahead and plot a table real quick of the values we're looking at so we can get some better idea of what's going on. And so we're going to have off to the side uh, let's see, t, x, and y. I'm going to have a column for each. So let's go ahead and see what we have. So if I plug in, for example, we will do 1, sorry, 0, a 1, and 2. Now let's just plug these into my equations here. So if I plug in t equals 0 to the x equation, we get 0. Uh, same thing for the y. If I plug in this 1, and so my x and y equations, what I'm going to get is 2 and then 1. And then lastly for 2, plugging that into my equations for x and y, I should get 4 and 4. So what I'm going to have is this following graph. I'm going to have something like this. So x is still x here, y is still y. And then t is kind of just us thinking, all right, as time progresses, as time, go, as time goes on, and we're looking at this, uh, where do the points tend to go? And so we, we say that something like at time equals 0, right here, uh, what I have is the point 0, 0. So I'm just going to draw that here, right at the origin. And then as we wait one unit, maybe a second, something like that, I'm now going to be at the point 2, 1 in the xy plane. I'm going to move over two units. Oh, 1 to land me right here. And again, this is just a basic example. Uh, so if you already kind of know what this is, you can go ahead and skip ahead. Okay. Uh, lastly, we're going to look at what happens at time equals 2, which means I'm at the point 4, 4 in the xy plane. So basically what we get is a point right here. And I'm going to be moving like this. And so you'll recall that I said that um, parametric equations have an orientation. And so the orientation here uh, is currently not represented in this graph. And the way we do that is we look at the direction we're going as time increases. So as I go from time equals 0 to 2, 
what happens is I go to the right and up. That is, I go along this direction. So what we can do is label these with arrows. Now show what direction I'm moving along. Okay, so now that we kind of know uh, what parametric equations are, um, and again, we say that our parameter, just our parameter is going to be t, then what we can do is <clears throat> ask, uh, how do we eliminate the parameter? So let's go ahead and look at exactly what that means. And then we'll start looking at uh, different things we can do in terms of derivatives and just uh, more complex uh, analysis. So when we're eliminating the parameter, essentially what we're doing um, is getting t out of the system of equations that we have. Uh, parameter. And so essentially all that is is getting y as a function of x, or x as a function of y. Okay, so let's take as an example uh, the following equation. x equals t squared plus 2. And then y, and of course this is x of t, y of t is going to be 2t minus 1. So we could do exactly what we did last time. It is have a, a table with uh, t, x, and y, plot the points. But sometimes it might be even easier to kind of get an idea of what we're graphing by just plugging in uh, one of these functions into the other. So what I mean by that is let's go ahead and isolate this function and solve it in terms of t. So I have y equals 2t minus 1. I can rearrange this, y plus 1, all divided by 2. Now equal to t. So what I can do with this now is plug it into the x equation. So I take x equals t squared plus 2. But now instead of t squared, I'm going to square this term right here. And then add 2 to it. We can do the algebra. What we're going to get is 1 fourth times y squared plus 2y plus 1 plus 2. And then if we continue this out, we get 1 fourth y squared plus 1 half y plus, and we're going to have 1 fourth plus 2, which is 8 fourths. So we're going to get 9 fourths. And all of this is equal to x. And if we were so compelled to, we could draw this. This would be a parabola opening to the right. <coughs> okay, so now that we've kind of gone over some basic ideas, again, talking about uh, just what a parametric equation is, something that has uh, a new, an introduction of a new parameter t. And now we talked about what eliminating the parameter means. Now let's go ahead and look at um, some more calculus type things. So what we're going to do now is talk about the derivatives of parametric equations. And so uh, what we know is that, um, so we're going to say we know that dy dx, the derivative of y with respect to x, is going to be dy dt over the x dt. And of course we have a big fraction here, so this is going to be provided that the denominator dx dt is not zero. Okay, so a couple points to note. Uh, one is going to be um, if dy dt equals zero, um, what is that exactly going to tell us about our parametric equation? So go ahead and pause and think about it for a second if you don't know. Um, but what this is going to do is this is going to give us points of some type of tangency. <clears throat> and so we can see, <coughs> excuse me, is that dy dt is right here. Oops, sorry. 
dy dt is right here in the numerator. And so if that's going to be zero, then of course this is going to be points of horizontal tangency. Okay, so then we're also going to look at dx dt. And of course, if that is equal to zero, well, that's going to be bad news for us. Um, what this is going to do is give us points of vertical tangency. So the slope would not be defined at such a point. Okay. So, let's see. Um, and then one last thing, just so we have it written down, is that when we're just in the concavity, that is, uh, you know, looking at information about the second derivative, what we have is the d squared y over dx squared, which is saying that the second derivative of y with respect to x. Uh, of course, just by definition, is going to be the derivative with respect to x of dy dx. And so what we're going to do is take the derivative with respect to x of dy dx, but recall that dy dx is right up here. And so what we actually end up getting is the derivative with respect to t, sorry, one moment, of dy dx over dx dt. So this is going to be our second derivative. And just to recall, uh, we know that if the second derivative is positive, then that means that our graph is going to be concave up. If our second derivative is negative, then our graph is going to be concave down. Okay, so we're going to look at sort of a complex example just to kind of tie everything we did together. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. Let's give ourselves some space. Okay. So what we're going to be looking at is, so this is going to be an example question. We're going to say a curve, C is defined by the following set of parametric equations. It's defined by x of t equal to t squared minus t, and then y of t equal to t cubed minus 3t minus 1. Okay, now uh, we're going to be interested in a certain, or a couple of different things here. So the first thing we're going to look at, part a, it's going to be saying, uh, find the point, which will denote A, which has coordinates x naught, y naught, where the curve C crosses itself. Oops. Where the curve C crosses itself. Okay, so. Uh, I mean, the first question would just be, what does it mean for the curve C to cross itself? And so, basically what we have is, you can imagine, and I'm just going to draw some contrived examples, uh, we have some curve just moving around, it's defined parametrically, and so at different points T, all I'm uh, seeing is just where exactly I am in the XY plane. Basically, different values of T correspond to different points X, Y in the plane, and I'm moving around, moving around. And so C is going to cross itself, but we have something like this. So at this point, we have a self-intersection. And so what this would mean, kind of intuitively, is that at two different values of T, I have the same X and Y value. So that is to say, uh, what I'm going to have is that X time 1 equals X time 2. If these are the two different times at which I'm at this X value. And then, same thing for the Y's, so what I'm going to have is uh, if I'm at this point right here, 
uh, one time is equal to T1 and T2. Then, of course, the y coordinate is going to be the same. They're going to coincide. What I have is this. This is kind of an intuition of what's going behind this question. So let's go ahead and look at how we actually solve something like this. And again, this is not necessarily the curve we have. I don't even think it's close, but uh, just to kind of get an idea of what's going on. All right. So uh, what we're going to take is, well, we're going to have two different equations. We're going to have an equation for x. We're going to have an equation for y. So what do I mean by this? Well, exactly what I have right over here. And so let's uh, kind of just, for example, say that, um, and we'll put a note here, um, we're going to let A and B be the times at which uh, the curve C, and we'll just say at which C has the same x, y value. So in this case, A and B are going to be like my T1 and T2. So uh, if I look at the x equation right here, and I plug in the value a, I'm going to get a squared minus a. So again, a is just a value of time. And this should be equal to, well, b squared minus b for this exact same reason here. All I'm doing is plugging in the different times that get me to the exact same point. And so these different times will produce the exact same x coordinates. So what we do is we can take uh, a little bit of, or, sorry, we can do a little bit of algebra and see that a squared minus b squared is, of course, a minus b. Back to the left-hand side, we get a plus b times a minus b equals a minus b. Okay, so now at this point, uh, what can I do? Well, we recognize that we have a minus b on both sides. And so what I'm allowed to do is divide by a minus b, which would give me a equals 1 minus b. But I can only divide by a minus b if it's not equal to 0. So we're going to go ahead and put a note on this. So I'm going to move down just a little bit. So I can do this if and only if a minus b is not equal to 0, which means if and only if a is not equal to b. So go ahead and think exactly what this means. <coughs> Again, a and b are the um, kind of assumed times, these different times at which we're at the same x and y uh, coordinate. So it would make sense that a and b are not the same, because if they were, then, uh, well, then that wouldn't really make too much sense. Okay, so now what we have out of this, some equation that we're going to hold on to until later, we have that a is equal to 1 minus b. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to do the same exact thing for the y equation. So I'll pull this up just a little bit so you can see it. Uh, we're going to take this y equation right here. Plug in A on the left-hand side and B on the right-hand side and see what we can do. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to get A cubed minus 3A minus 1 equals B cubed minus 3B minus 1. And so this one is a little bit tricky if you're just kind of seeing it for the first time. But essentially what's going on here is we're going to take A cubed minus 3A. Um, and then, well, actually, sorry, I should have said this. Uh, what's happening here is that the minus ones on both sides can cancel out because those are the only terms common on both sides of the equation. <coughs> so we get a cubed minus 3a is b cubed minus 3b. 
Okay, let's group everything to the same side. So we're going to bring uh, a cubed minus b cubed minus 3a plus 3b equal to 0. And again, all this stuff kind of seems like maybe a little bit out there, a little bit nonsensical, but uh, essentially all we're doing right now is just you know eliminating this thing right here and then grouping everything to the same side. And just kind of like with the x equation, we saw that we had this difference of squares. Here we're going to have a difference of cubes, a cubed minus b cubed. So we factored that into a minus b times a squared plus a b plus b squared minus 3 times a minus b all gives us 0. So what we have here is this common term a minus b. So we can again factor that out. And what we get is a squared plus a b plus b squared and then minus 3 equals 0. So now we have a product of two terms equaling 0. So we know that uh, setting each one to 0 will give us uh, a factor, sorry, a root. So what we have here from this first equation, whoops, is that, let's see, from here we get a minus b equals 0, or a equals b, but we're working under the assumption that a is not equal to b in the first place. We can see that right here. And so we ignore this solution. All right, now from the second one, what we see is that um, we're going to have a squared plus ab plus b squared minus 3 equals 0. So we have one equation with two unknowns, but you can recall that from before we had the a is equal to 1 minus b. So we go ahead and plug that in to what we have right now. What we're going to get is 1 minus b squared plus 1 minus b times b plus b squared minus 3 equals 0. And I would really encourage you to try this out yourself, not just kind of passively watch because uh, it's easy to get caught up and confused with questions like these. All right, so I'm scroll down a little bit. Um, just to finish this one off, what we're going to get is 1 minus 2b plus b squared. Multiply this next term out, we get b minus b squared plus b squared minus 3 all equal to 0. So what we're going to do is cancel things that we can. We get a minus b squared plus the b squared here. And that is all that we can really do. So what we're going to get is, let's see, is that all we can do? Uh, we can combine other like terms. So what we're going to get is, whoops, let's get back to black. b squared. I'm going to get minus 2b plus b, so minus b. 1 minus 3, this is minus 2. Things are looking better now, almost there. And so what we're going to get, and so after factoring, well, we're going to get b minus 2 times b plus 1 equals 0. And so we're going to get b, whoops, b equals 2, and then b equals minus 1. <coughs> and so remember that a equals 1 minus b. So in this case, what we get is a equals 1 minus 2. So negative 1. And in this case, what we get is a equals 1 minus negative 1. We get 2. And so all this is really saying um, is that, so here we see 2 and negative 1. Here we see negative 1 and 2. Uh, it doesn't matter which one you essentially take, but basically what this is saying is the time of self-intersection is going to be, uh, so at negative 1, we're at that point, and also, likewise, at uh, 2. And those are going to be the times at which, again, we're going to be at the same value. So if this is just my example, then I'm at this point here, 
at time equals negative one and time two. <clears throat> and uh, we're not actually done with the question because, well, the question says, again, find the point uh, where C crosses itself. And so we have the time at which this happens. So all we really need to do is plug this in to my x and y equation. So uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, let's see here. We're going to do plug each of these values in for my x and y equations that I have above. So let's go ahead and copy these down again. So x, t is t squared minus t. <coughs> and then y of t is, let's see, t cubed minus 3t <coughs> minus 1. And so it doesn't matter which value uh, of time that I plug in uh, because, you know, they're going to give the exact same point. Um, and so you can do both of them just to check. And so we can see that x negative 1 is equal to negative 1 squared minus negative 1, which is going to be <clears throat> 1 minus negative 1, 2. And then y negative 1 is going to be negative 1 cubed minus 3 times negative 1 minus 1. <clears throat> so we get 1 plus, sorry, negative 1 plus 3 minus 1. And that is going to just be 1. Okay, so apparently the point x not, y not, the point of self intersection is 2, 1. And so what you can do is just verify, do this yourself, that uh, when I look at the same equations evaluated not at negative 1, but at 2, that I get x of 2, well, it should be equal to 2. <clears throat> and that, uh, is that right? Let's see. Um, yes. And that y of 2 will be 1. So you can go ahead and verify that yourself. But that's essentially what we have over here. Okay, so we're going to look at a couple more things with this one and then move on to something a little bit different. <clears throat> so, yes, all this right here, all this that you're seeing is just part A of the question. So, again, we're going to keep looking at this curve. Now what we're going to do is we're going to find the equations of the tangent lines of both tangents at A. Um, so... Let's go down here. So what we're going to do is find the equations of both tangent lines at k, which again is the point we just found. Two, one. And so to find the tangent line of equation, uh, all we really need is the point and the slope. And so what we want is to find um, the values that will satisfy this equation. My, my point slope form, so y minus y naught is m times x minus x naught. <clears throat> this is what we want. And in fact, we're um, almost there, actually. What we have already, let's keep track. So we have, we have the point x naught y naught equals 2, 1. So we have the point of tangency. All we need to do is find the slope. So this is going to be our derivative. And so what we're going to do here is as follows. 
So what we have is, <clears throat> uh, again, let's go ahead and just write down. So we have x of t, again, is equal to t squared minus t, y of t is equal to t cubed minus 3t minus 1, just so we know what equations we're working with. <coughs> and so again, if you want the tangent line, we're going to have to look at information of the derivative. And so <coughs> What we want here, <clears throat> excuse me, is to find dy dx. So remember, dy dx is dy dt over dx dt. And so we have <clears throat> x and y, so we can easily find the, their derivatives with respect to t. And so what we're going to have oops, is that dx dt is going to be equal to 2t minus 1, while dy dt <coughs> is going to be 3t squared minus 3. Okay, so what we're going to do is uh, plug those into this equation. And so my slope dy dx dy dt over dx dt, which is going to be 3t squared minus 3 over 2t minus 1. All right, so now I have the slope, and again, this is really just going to be my m in this equation. Let's scroll up here a little bit. And so <clears throat> we want to find uh, the slope at a certain point, right? So what we're going to do, actually, is um, to be able to evaluate this. Um, let's see. One moment. Okay. So, um, again, so we're at this point, 2, 1 at two different values of time. And so the times at which these occur, so this, um, so we'll say we are at this point. When t equals minus 1, and when t equals 2. So what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate uh, our derivative, just tell us our slope, we're going to evaluate that at time t equals 1, sorry, negative 1, to get one um, tangent line, right, because we're looking for uh, two different tangent lines. So like, essentially what we have is something like this, and maybe if we had the orientation on it, it would look like this. And then moving around. <clears throat> and so when I first hit this point, uh, there's going to be one tangent line here. And then when I loop back around and come all the way here, again, there's going to be another tangent line, uh, which is, of course, going to have a different slope. So first we're going to look at it when time t equals 1. So when that happens, uh, we evaluate it. And what we're going to get is 3 times negative 1 squared minus 3 over 2 times negative 1 minus 1. Again, this screen is getting a little crowded right now. I apologize for that. Um, but essentially, what we're going to get here is on the top, we're going to have 3 minus 3 over negative 2 minus 1. But we don't care really about the bottom because the top is equal to 0. And so this is equal to 0. <clears throat> okay. So let's look at this first tangent line. And so the first tangent line that I'm going to have all right, so we have y minus y naught equals m times x minus x naught. We know the point x naught y naught is 2, 1. So I'm going to get y minus 1 equal to m 
times x minus q. And so the slope that we just calculated this m for the example, for the case of t equals 1, is going to be 0. So get my y minus 1 equal to 0 times x minus 2. That just leaves me with y minus 1 equals 0, which is, of course, y equals 1. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so this is our first tangent line. Second tangent line, well, it's going to have the exact same point, x naught, y naught. This is a different slope. And so what we're going to do is evaluate this thing again, but at a different point in time, and that's going to be when t equals 2. Okay. So what we're going to have is dy dx equals 3t squared minus 3 over 2t minus 1. Evaluated at time equals 2 now. So to speed it up, we'll get 3 times 2 squared minus 3 over 2 times 2 minus 1, <clears throat> which is going to be 9 over 3, which is 3. So the tangent line for our second one, so the tangent line when t equals 2, uh, we should say the tangent line at t1, which occurs when time equals 2, is going to be uh, y minus y naught equals m times x minus x naught. And again, what we're going to get is the same point x naught y naught. But now my slope is going to be So solving this out, we just get y equals 3x, and I get minus 6 plus 1, so we get minus 5. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to move on just in the interest of time. Um, there are other things you can do with a question like this, like looking at the points where tangent is horizontal or vertical, uh, but all that amounts to is taking dy dt and dx dt and setting them equal to zero to solve for the time. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to look at some other things with um, parametric equations. And that in particular, we're going to be looking at uh, arc length and surface area. So let's go ahead and zoom in here. So I'm just looking at arc length of parametric equations. Okay, so the basic idea here is that uh, we're going to have some, uh, uh, some, sorry, the graph of some equation that's given by uh, parametric equations actually. So we want to know the arc length. And so again, we can think about the arc length is let's take uh, two different points. And then if you can imagine uh, all of this part of the function right here as like some string or rope or yarn, if we were to kind of flatten that out, make it taut, you want to know uh, just the length of that segment right there. And so uh, we've done this before when we looked at um, pair, or sorry, arc length just for functions y equals f of x. So we're not going to go through exactly the derivation, but essentially what we get is that the arc length is equal to the integral from alpha to beta square root dx dt squared plus dy dt squared dt. <clears throat> and then in this case, uh, so my integral is in terms of t, the parameter. And so my bounds basically is saying that t is between alpha and beta. <clears throat> so right, so in this picture what I would have is that uh, this point right here 
is x evaluated at alpha, y evaluated at alpha, and then similarly this point right here is x of beta, and then, oops, sorry, and then y of beta. Okay, right, so um, let's go ahead and look at an example of this. So again, this is our equation. I'll zoom out just a little bit. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at an example real quick. Let's see. Okay, so we're going to find the arc length. of the curve given by, uh, so we're going to have x of t equals 3 times sine of t, and then y of t is equal to 3 times cosine of t, for t between 0 and 2 pi. So again, for this question to be a complete question to have all the information, I need to tell you the functions that we have, x of t, y of t, and the balance on t. Alrighty, so, oops, sorry, one second. Alright, so how exactly are we going to do this? Well, uh, we're going to use this integral right here, which is not very tiny on your screen. Um, we're going to say we're going to integrate. So my balance are going to be from 0 to 2 pi. Uh, so what we're going to do is take the integral of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared uh, dt. And so let's go ahead and find what dx dt and dy dt are going to be. So dx dt is just the derivative of this x function with respect to t. I get 3 times cosine of t. And dy dt, of course, is going to be negative 3 times the sine of t. Plugging this into our equation, we see that we have the integral from 0 to 2 pi of dx dt squared. So we're going to get 9 cosine squared of t plus dy dt squared is going to be 9 sine squared of t dt. So this is going to equal. Zero to pi. So we can factor out a nine. We're going to get. <clears throat> I'll write it this way: sine squared of t plus cosine squared of t dt. Uh, you'll recognize that this is just equal to one. So we need nine times one or nine. And so all I'm doing is taking integral from zero to two pi of nine. Which is really nice for us. So now we get 9t, 0, 2 pi. So we're going to get 18. Okay, so again, we're just looking at the arc length of, let's see, arc length of the curve given by this set of parametric equations. We have our equation here. Uh, first thing we do is just take derivatives and then plug those into our equation. All right, very good. Um, so next thing we're going to look at, so we had the arc length, now we're going to look at the surface area that we can generate. So what we're going to have is, let's make this bigger. Let's look at arc. Sorry, uh, that's what we just did. Uh, surface area. And again, this is still going to be for parametric equations. And so what we have is, from before we know that ds, our differential arc length element, is going to be, we can just write it as x prime squared plus y prime squared dt. 
Um, and again, x prime is just the derivative of x with respect to t. And so what we're going to have is uh, s, which is our surface area, is going to be the integral of 2 times pi times y ds. Uh, in the case that we're revolving our uh, equation, or our, our, the graph of our equation, about the x-axis. Then, or we could have the case that s is the integral to pi x ds. In this case, we'd be revolving about the y-axis. And if you have no clue what I mean about uh, revolving about different axes, uh, basically what we're doing when, when we talk about finding the surface area is imagine we have some a graph of some function like this, and again this is just going to be some parametrically defined graph. And what we're going to do is revolve it about the axis. So at each point on the graph of this equation, what we're going to do is we're going to revolve it about this axis, the x-axis. So essentially what I'm saying is imagine taking this point and drawing it around and imagine that its trace being left behind. And what you get is just some circle like that. You do that to every point along this graph. Keep going, keep going, something like this. Maybe a little exaggerated. And basically what you're going to get is some figure. Maybe think of it as like some pot, some base, something like that. Okay, more or less. And then we're just looking at the surface area of that uh, object, however much stuff it has on the outside. This is the equations that we're going to work with. Let's do one quick example, and then we'll move on to polar functions. So for parametric, so for finding the surface area of parametric equations, uh, again, those are the equations that we're going to use. So let's look at the question. Whoops. Let's see. All right, so the question is going to be, <clears throat> determine the surface area uh, obtained by rotating the following parametric curve. Um, about the x-axis. About the x-axis. Okay, and the curve is going to be given by x equals 3 cosine theta. Sorry, cosine cube theta. y is equal to sine cube theta and then theta is between 0 and pi over 2. Alright, let's see here. Okay. So, um, we're going to use the equation, so we will use, let's use a different color here. Uh, let's go ahead and do black. So we will use this formula. So the integral of 2 pi y times ds. But remember that ds is just x prime squared plus y prime squared this is going to be dt. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and scroll down a little bit. And so uh, we know that we're going to be integrating this from 0 to pi over 2. 
All right, so let's stop for a second and just look at this and see what we have and see what we need to figure out. So uh, what we have is, you know, what we have y, y is just sine cube of theta. Uh, sorry, this should be d theta. Um, but we need to find these derivatives. So we'll start there. So uh, x prime theta is going to be the derivative of this function right here. So what we're going to get is 9 cosine squared theta times a negative sine theta. So we're going to get negative 9 cosine squared theta sine theta. So we're good here. Now we're going to need y prime of theta. This is going to be a little bit easier, so we take the derivative here. We're going to get uh, 3 sine squared theta. And then ah, we still need, to multiply, still need to use the chain rule. So after bringing that 3 down, uh, multiplying and decreasing this power by 1, we need to multiply by cosine theta. So what we're going to get is going to be 3 sine squared theta plus sine theta. So now we have this. Now we can go ahead and move on with our problem. And so what we want is the surface area, which is the integral from 0 to pi over 2. 2 times pi times y. We'll call that y is sine cubed to theta. And then we're going to have the square root of x prime squared. And so what we're going to get is 81 cosine to the fourth theta sine squared theta plus y prime squared. So we're going to get 9 sine to the fourth theta cosine squared theta d theta. So this does not look that fun to deal with, uh, but that's okay. We can do it. It's so going to be the integral from 0 to pi over 2. Uh, what we can do, take the 2 pi out. So we have sine cubed of theta. So what are we going to do instead of here? So we're going to take out the greatest, uh, sorry, we're going to factor out the greatest term. So we're going to have a 9, and what they share in common is a sine squared of theta and a cosine squared of theta. Factored out, what we're going to get is 9 cosine squared of theta plus sine squared of theta. Alright, hopefully this is all right. Looks good. So we're going to get it's 2 pi, 0 to pi over 2, sine cubed of theta. Uh, so we're going to break this up into two different terms. So we're going to have square root of 9 sine squared theta, cosine squared theta, square root of 9 cosine squared of theta, plus sine squared of theta, theta. <clears throat> Alright, so from this first term, we're going to get pi over 2 sine cubed theta. We're going to get times 3 sine theta cosine of theta. Let's see. I'm doing this right.
All right, and so this would just be the setup for the, for the question. <clears throat> a lot of times it'll just be asked to set up and not evaluate the interval. For this one, you can go ahead and try it, but for, for just the purposes of this video, I'm going to stop right here. So for this last part of the video, we're going to go ahead and look at polar equations. Uh, and so first we need to first talk about like what we even mean when we talk about polar coordinates, things like that. And so basically, if we go back to the xy plane, um, what we have is, so this is our x-axis and this is our y-axis. And when they meet, we're at the origin. And so I can specify any point in this coordinate system by an x value and a y value, which we call an ordered pair. <clears throat> and in this way of specifying coordinates, my x just tells me however far I have to walk right or left, and the y value tells me however far I have to walk up and down. But it's useful in a lot of contexts to have different ways of talking about points um, because you know they might simplify um, our integral, um, they might simplify just equations in general. And so what I can do is Imagine that I have, you know, just a bunch of concentric circles centered at the origin. Going like this, there's going to be one that contains this point right here. And so let's imagine this point not being some sort of rectangular coordinates where I just go right, left, up, and down, but sitting on a circle of radius r. Okay, so certainly. Um, this point is only going to lie, this point x, y that I have is only going to lie on one circle centered at the origin of radius r. And so um, what I'm going to try to do is talk about this point right here uh, using this r, but <clears throat> I'm going to need one more thing to specify it because there are many different points in the circle that have radius r. So just giving the radius is not going to be enough information. What I'm also going to do is give this angle right here which we'll call theta, which is the angle that this line segment makes with the positive x-axis. So what I'm saying here is that when we use polar coordinates, um, what we're going to do is express points. So points are expressed as r theta. And so what we can do is look at a little trigonometry here and see that, all right, first let's imagine that this was just x and this right here is just y. So, whoops, not mean to do that, that's okay. So here we have x and here we have y. So we have a right angle here. And so if we look at the setup that we have, uh, what we see is that, um, let's look at, for example, the cosine of theta. So this is our first point here. So we have the cosine, oops, that's not what I want. One moment. All right, so what we're going to have is that the cosine of theta it's going to be adjacent over hypotenuse, so x over r, which tells me that x is equal to r times cosine of theta. Similarly, for the sine of theta, we get y over r, which means that y is equal to r times sine of theta. So this is how we're going to um, express points in different systems. So in the... Um, rectangular coordinates and polar coordinates, this is how we're going to um, go between them. So we're going to use these equations. Uh, other things of interest to us is, well, we can use the Pythagorean theorem to see that, in this case, 
x squared plus y squared equal to r squared. So that means for us that r is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared. So for these first two, they're going to be useful for us when the points are given in terms of polar coordinates, and we want to recover the information about their rectangular coordinates. So this is going to be polar to, so we'll say converting from polar to rectangular coordinates. And then last thing we're going to look at is, so now if I'm given the point x, y, I can find the radius r. But how do we find theta? So theta has to um, be a relationship between x and y. And what we know is that if you look at the tangent, now it builds over here, uh, the tangent of theta, um, so yes, that's going to be the opposite, which is y, over the adjacent, which is x. So what that means for us is that theta is the inverse tangent of y over x. Now, this isn't the entire story. This is just what's going to happen if we're in like, the first quadrant, for example. Um, and so we might have to add or subtract 180 degrees from this. But these are the equations we're going to use. And this is going to be a particular use. We have to convert from, so in this case, we're not going from polar to rectangular, but rather converting from rectangular coordinates to polar coordinates. All right, so we're going to do one last example, and then we'll stop here for today. Right. Just to practice what we just learned. And so what we're going to do is we're going to convert... Um, first thing we're going to do is convert, well, I'm going to say convert, yeah, sorry, one second. So in part A, we're going to convert negative 3, oops, so we're going to convert negative 2, 2 pi over 3 into rectangular, sometimes you'll see them read as Cartesian coordinates. And so what we're going to do, so these are this is given in polar coordinates, and so we're going to convert it into Cartesian coordinates, and again, that's just the same thing as saying rectangular. So I want x to be r cosine theta. And so my radius here is going to be negative 2. And again, my angle is going to be theta. That's how it's read. So I'm going to take negative 2 times the cosine 2 pi over 3. So it's going to be negative 2 times negative 1 half. So that's just going to give us positive 1. Y is going to be R sine of theta. So we're going to get negative 2 times sine 2 pi over 3, which is going to be negative 2 times square root of 3 over 2. So it's going to be negative 2 root 3 over 2, which is just negative square root. So this point uh, in the xy plane is going to have an x value of 1. 
and the y value of negative square root of 2. Right, let's look at one final example and then we'll be done. All right, so for this next example, what we're going to have is we're going to convert the point one one into polar coordinates. Okay, so if we're converting into polar coordinates, what we have right now is we're taking the coordinates x, y. And so what I'm going to do is say that r is equal to the square root x squared plus y squared. And so this is going to be the square root of 1 squared plus 1 squared equals 2 root 2. And then theta is going to be the inverse tangent y over x which in this case will just be inverse tangent of 1. We know that that's just going to be pi over 4. And so we conclude that our theta is root 2 pi over 4. So what this means is that we are on a circle of radius of square root of 2. Uh, at an angle of pi over 4 on the positive x-axis. So then here, my radius is equal to square root 2. So that is all for this video. Uh, thank you for watching.